I praise the Lord for this opportunity. And, and let me tell you why I come. Bart, Bart introduced me as his friend. I, I'm here tonight because I'm Bart's friend. Um, there are, I, I get asked to speak quite a bit by people who are more interested in what I have to say than who I am. And, and those of you that speak a lot, you, you know what I'm talking about. They're people who are interested in your gift, but not interested in you. Now, there's a word for that in the world. And it begins with a P and ends in R-O-S-T-I-T-U-T-E. And one of the things I like about Bart Campolo is he's not just interested in people because of their gifts. And, and we have a covenant. And I just want to share this because this is, this is why I'm here tonight. Because, see, there was supposed to be somebody else here tonight, and Bart asked me at the last minute when I step in, and I wouldn't be doing that for nobody else. I'd be home watching television. But I said to Bart 10 years ago when we first started working together, I said, Bart, let's try to have a different kind of relationship. Let's have a relationship where the only time we call each other is not when we need each other to speak for, on something. Let's have a relationship when we call each other from time to time just to see how we're doing and to be brothers to each other. Let, let's not just call each other when you need a speaker or I need a consultant or I need a grant to be do this or you need a grant to do that. We use each other too much in the kingdom. And there's a whole lot of spiritual prostitution going on in the kingdom. Beware of people who want your gifts but don't love you. And so I'm here tonight because Bart Campolo loves me and because I love Bart Campolo. And so I thank God for the privilege of being at Kingdom Works. We've been coming back to Kingdom Works ever since the first conference when we met in the church basement in North Philadelphia. About 40 people. And look what God has done. And we thank God for all of you that have traveled to be here tonight. Look what the Lord has done. Bart, Bart started out in the wrong hotel and then Tim Merrill, a Baptist minister with dreadlocks. You know, uh, urban street level making folk yell, I don't know what you come to do. I get scared when I'm in a room of 1,200 people. I don't know what they came to do. So, 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 so the Lord must have us here for a reason. Now, now my job at Kingdom Works, if you've never heard me before, I'm, uh, my job at Kingdom Works is to be the killjoy. That's my role. Always has been, always will be. Going to preach the same thing I preached two years ago. Revised version, but same thing. Because the Lord just won't let this thing off of me. He won't let this thing off of me that the key ingredient in youth ministry is not the technique, it's not the training. The key is not all of the tricks of the trade that we learn when we come to these kinds of conferences. The key is not what we're going to learn. That will help us and that will assist us. But the key is what is God doing in your life. And as I move around the country and I talk with people who are involved in the lives of urban kids, I, I see a lot of passion for kids, but I don't see as much depth of spirit. I see a lot of people who care about kids who really want to get out there and make a difference. But the enthusiasm is, is it's like a puddle. It's, it's, it's very wide, but it's not real deep. And when I go into the Cuyahoga County Juvenile Detention Center in Cleveland, or when I go to San Francisco and walk into the Juvenile Detention Center there, or when I talk with people in Boston who are working in places like Dorchester and Roxbury with some of the most difficult kids in the country, I realize it's going to take more than enthusiasm. It's going to take more than caring about kids. It's going to take a depth of a work that God is going to do in your life and in my life. And everything else just falls into place after that. I think that's why Jesus said, seek ye first 
the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. And so I'm drawn back to the same place I keep getting drawn back every time I come to Kingdom Works. It's 1 Kings 19. It's Elijah at Mount Horeb. Elijah the prophet, the one who is the great man of God. Elijah, the person that is so powerful, so gifted, so anointed, that when God has his choice of anybody to stand on the Mount of Transfiguration with Jesus and Moses, he chooses Elijah to represent the prophetic tradition. Elijah, a man so anointed of God that when James has his choice of anybody to give as an example of a man of passionate prayer, he chooses Elijah. A man whose oratory was so strong that when John the Baptist came to town, they said, Elijah's back. This was a man who didn't need an appointment to go see King Ahab. All he needed was his anointing. He walked right into the throne room and said, As the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand, there shall be no dew nor rain these years except according to my word. And then he walked right out of that throne room. The guards couldn't arrest him. The soldiers couldn't stop him. The anointing of God was on his life. He had such an anointing that he... He did his own urban ministry, went down to the projects in Zarephath. Found a widow woman who had been cut off by welfare reform. I'm sorry, the Personal Work and Responsibility Act of 1996. She was down to her last, well, in Philadelphia, we don't have hostess Twinkies. You're in Philly, so we say tasty cakes. Down to her last tasty cake, and he said, if you just let me have that, that little butterscotch crumpet, the Lord will make sure that you won't go hungry again. And then took her son up on the rooftop of the projects after his light had been snuffed out. And the anointing of God came upon him, the breath of God came through him, and a young man came back to life again. Such an anointing, he went out to Mount Carmel against 400 false prophets. And they told them, you go ahead and call on your false god. I'll just sit here and watch. Started making fun of them. They're running around prophesying, jumping up and down, stepping on people's feet. And <laughs> cutting themselves. And Elijah starts making fun of him. He says, maybe your God has gone on a vacation. And then in the King James, there's this euphemism. Maybe he's gone aside. When the Hebrew, that really means maybe your God's in the bathroom. He had such confidence that God would answer his prayer to bring fire down out of heaven that he had them pour water on the sacrifices. Watch my God light up a wet sacrifice. And almost before the words of prayer got out of his mouth, a fire came down from heaven and consumed the sacrifices. You know the story. He did everything right. The anointing of God was upon him. Things were going his way. And what was his reward? The queen said, may God do to me. And more so, the same thing that you did to my prophets. If I don't make your life like one of theirs by this time tomorrow. And the prophet of God, the role model, that, that's what we're trotting out in front of you for the next two days. We're, we're trotting out role models, anointed people, folks who are successful, people who've got it all together, the role model of God. The Bible says he ran for his life. You know when this scripture first became real to me? When I resigned my first and only pastorate. I was a failure. I did everything right, at least I thought I did. I was a legend in my own mind. I succeeded at everything I'd ever done. I'd had a successful urban youth ministry, successful career as a teacher, came in and I was gonna turn this church around. And you know what, that was the problem. I was gonna turn the church around. And that's your problem because you're going to turn your community around. I know you give God the glory, but it's really going to be you. And after I submitted my letter of resignation, I got on a train and went to Boston. 
And I started reading the scriptures, and the Lord brought me to this passage in the midst of my frustration. I, I thought I'd done everything right. He said, but you didn't dig deep enough. And you, didn't, you weren't rooted. You weren't anchored. You, weren't, you didn't have the foundation set. You, you tried to do it through preaching and through teaching and not enough prayer, not enough stillness. You had all the techniques. You went to all the workshops. You, you, you had all the training. You got more degrees than a thermometer. But it takes more than that. You got to dig deeply. And he, he, he gave me this, this, this scripture, and, and I read through, and I saw how God took care of Elijah in the midst of this struggle, in the midst of his own failure. And, 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 and then I, I, it got so much for me. I, and this has never happened to you, but, but the Lord starts dealing with you. You just put the Bible up. And I, I said, I, that's it. I can't take this anymore. I, I, I don't want to deal with, 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 with failure. I, I closed the Bible, got out with Sports Illustrated. I was riding through Connecticut, looking out over the Long Island Sound, reading my Sports Illustrated, and there was an article, and they were quoting this guy named Don Zimmer. He was a baseball coach, and, and he was talking about the minor leagues. He said, you know why we have minor leagues? So our ball players can go someplace off in a corner somewhere, and they can fail and learn how to fail so that when they get to the big leagues, they'll have practice handling failure. Then I had to close the Sports Illustrated. God will talk to you through a magazine. You can close the Bible and he'll make a bald-headed Boston Red Sox coach speak to you. And I said, Lord, how come there's no minor league for ministry? How come there's no place we can go off in a corner and fail in? And even in Elijah's case, he goes off all by himself. Nobody knows he's there, but the Holy Ghost must have had a recorder somewhere because we get the story. Doesn't sound like a prophet now, does he? 1 Kings chapter 19. I know it's late. In the words of, you know, what Henry VIII told his wife, I won't keep you long. I'm sorry. <laughs> First Kings 19, verse 3. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey, he came to a broom tree, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord. Take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Sounds more like a Popeye than a prophet, doesn't he? You all remember Popeye? I said, I had all I can stand. I can't stand no more. Tried to do it right, and it didn't work. You know it doesn't always work. You know you're going to take some of this stuff back from the conference, and it ain't going to work. You know you're going to take a whole lot of notes in somebody's seminar, and you're going to think you got together. You're going to take it right back to your home, and you're going to fall flat on your face. It's not going to work. Because this stuff is not a formula. You can't just name it and claim it, blab it and grab it. God is not a cosmic bellhop waiting for you to hit the bell so he can move the way you want him to move because you've hit the bell in just the right way and said in the name of Jesus at the end of hitting your bell. I have a degree in anthropology, and they told us there's a difference between magic and religion. In magic, you have a formula, and you do things according to a certain formula, and the things come out a certain way. That's not faith. That's magic. That's not religion, that's magic. It doesn't always work. And so Elijah runs, he can't take it anymore. He says, I'm ready to die. So what do you do when you've run out of tricks? What do you do when the kids aren't interested anymore? What do you do 
when the lesson bombs? What do you do when the Bible study doesn't stick? What do you do when they're no longer interested in the, tri in, 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 in the trips? What do you do when you've prayed over a kid and it doesn't work? Elijah says, I give up. Now, you know, that's really not a bad place to be. Some of us need to give up. My kids watch WWF. And there's this character there named The Rock. And he has this, he has a couple lines that, I, that I'm going to preach on one, one of these days, Reverend Jacques. One of them is, know your role, shut your mouth. I'm going to preach that one day. The other one I'm going to preach is you need to take a long, tall drink of shut-up juice. <laughs> I give up. I can't try anymore. I admit it. I'm licked. I admit it. I can't handle it. I know it doesn't fit with the image of the youth worker, the, the hero with a J on his chest, WWJD on his, on his little wrist. I, I, I thought it was a radio station for at least six months. I'm sitting there trying to find WWJD on the car. Then my son, he goes to Christian, goes, Dad, it stands for what would Jesus do? Well, the answer is the right thing. Now, what that is takes some discernment. No more easy answers. You can't get the thing off your bracelet anymore and just make it work. God steps in. You see, this is not a story about how Elijah gets better. See, that's what people want you to think. That's, that's what some preachers want you to think. They want you to take these steps. And if you take these steps, you'll turn your life around. Read the Bible more. Pray more. You do this, it'll, it'll work. It'll, you'll turn around. That's not the way it works. We sing a song in my church, if you make one step, he'll make two. It's a great song, Bad Theology. Guess what? He already made the first step. By the time you make the first step, he's made two, three, four. In fact, he stepped all the way to Calvary before you made the first step. This is not a story about how Elijah gets better. This is not about how Elijah gets himself straightened out. This is not about how Elijah figures out what to do next. This is a story about how God steps in when a man realizes he can't handle it. And the sooner that each and every one of us realize that we're Elijah, the better off we'll be. If you've heard this talk before, you know the four points, although I added a fifth one. But the first one, what does God do? He sends an angel. And the angel says, arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. He gives Elijah, here, here's the first point, he gives him permission to take care of himself. One of the reasons that we get burnt out in youth ministries, we're so busy taking care of kids, we don't take care of ourselves. And God gives permission to every man, every woman, every person who is out there in the ministry. He gives permission. In fact, it's not just for permission. It's a mandate. I want you to take care of yourself. I love you so much. I want you to cooperate with my love for you by loving yourself. Take a vacation, get some rest, eat the right foods, go watch some television, it won't hurt you. Go take a walk in the park and you don't even have to talk to me while you're walking. You'll see evidence about me all the, all the time anyway, just, just, just walk. Take a deep breath, everybody in the room take a deep breath. I feel better if you don't. Do something for yourself. That's God's word to Elijah. He gives him permission to care for himself. The second thing that he does, he, he pauses and listens to Elijah. Elijah, what are you doing here? 
Now, in order to understand this point, of course, we have to understand what God is doing. God is not looking for information. We do not serve a God who needs information. Do you? I, I don't serve a God who needs information. I don't want a God who has to fake his stuff out. I don't want a God who asks me any questions to which he does not know the answer. I don't want God asking me a question because he don't know. Elijah, what are you doing here? He knew the answer. What is he doing? He's pausing. That's the second P. He's pausing to listen to Elijah. He's giving Elijah the opportunity to talk. He wants to hear Elijah. Now, he knows what's going on in Elijah's heart. So he knows how Elijah feels. But he also knows that Elijah needs to get it out. Elijah needs to tell God just what's on his mind. Elijah needs to tell God just how frustrated he is, just how angry he is, just how, 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 how miserable he is. And you do too. Stop being polite and treating God like he's a wimp, like he's a chump, like he's a punk, like he can't handle how you really feel. Since he already knows anyway, you might as well tell him. And you know what? He won't die. He won't fall apart. See, to some people, you can't tell how you really feel because they'll fall apart on you. Some folk, they're all spiritual until you tell them your, 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 your R-rated testimony, not that, not, not that PG testimony you usually give. You know, most of us testify in PG. You, you don't tell what's really going on. You just do the PG version because you know if you told the saints the R version and Lord help you if you go to the X version that they would just fall apart. And if they don't fall apart, then they start crossing all up on you, closing up all that body language stuff that they taught y'all down at the University of Texas in educational psychology, Dr. Rochester. They start closing up on you. Or they start giving you scripture verses you already know. Well, the Bible says, I know the Bible says that. Well, let me tell you what I would do if I were you. That, that's not helpful either. You know what I tell them? I say, you know what you'd be doing if I were you? You'd be doing what I'm doing because you'd be me. And folks say, well, 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 you can't feel that way. What do you mean I can't feel that way? I do feel that way. You know, folks, they, they, they mean well. But they don't listen to you. Christians don't listen to each other. They don't want to hear your real story. They don't want to hear what you're really struggling with. They don't want to hear you talk about struggling with some lust demon or, or with some other kind of really horrible carnal sin that immediately disqualifies you from ministry. They, 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 they don't want to hear you. They want to hear you say, I didn't have my devotions this morning. But God wants to hear it all. No matter how crazy, no matter how ludicrous, no matter how ridiculous, no matter how spiteful, let it out. He wants to hear it. That's how he's going to minister to you. Tell him how you really feel. Oh, I got too much respect for God to do that. Thomas said, you know what? I hear y'all talking about this resurrection stuff, but if I don't see it, if I can't put my finger in the hole in his hand and my hand in the hole in his side, I'm not going to believe it. And you know what? Jesus didn't say, hmm, Thomas is disrespectful. <laughs> you know, now, after all, I've been through up there on Calvary and then got raised from the dead. And then Thomas is going to act like this. Mm -hmm, all right, I got something for you, Thomas. 
He met him at the point of his honesty. He met him at the point of his doubt. He met him at the point of his skepticism. Tell God how you really feel. He wants to work with you at that very, very point. I like to tell the story of the time I got mad at God and uh, told God I didn't believe in him anymore. I was ready to quit the ministry. I was quitting the Christian faith. I was so mad at God. I said, that's it, Lord. I ain't preaching no more. I ain't going to church no more. And I don't believe in you no more. I got in my car. I started driving up the road. I was on Highway 1 going from Princeton, New Jersey to New Brunswick, New Jersey. And as soon as I got to New Brunswick, the Lord spoke to me with an audible voice. I heard the voice of God, just like, just like you're hearing my voice now. God said, if you don't believe in me anymore, who were you talking to when you said that? See, Elijah is talking crazy, but, but, but it's, God is able to look past his words and see his heart. Elijah says, Lord, I want to die. He didn't really want to die. Jezebel had said, if you stay here, I'll kill you. All he had to do if he really wanted to die was stay where he was. So his mouth is saying, I quit. But his heart is saying, help me. His mouth is saying, I can't take it anymore. But, but his heart is, is singing, oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come. His, his mouth is saying, I can't handle it. But his heart is saying, God is still on the throne. You, you, you know, a Christian is never on E. I was so glad Pastor Merrill today asked, how many of y'all brought the Holy Spirit with you? Because I get tired of folk talking about, I was in that church and the Holy Spirit wasn't there. You mean you didn't bring him? I don't know. My stuff is portable. In the Episcopal Church. I slip my hand up every now and then. Priest asked me one day, do you have a question? But the Spirit. The Spirit does not leave you. He who hath not the Spirit of Christ, it says in Romans 8, is none of his. Therefore, when you give up, there's still something in the tank. The gauge might say empty, but there's still some fumes down there. And God doesn't look at the gauge on the tank. He hooks up with the fumes in the tank, and he helps the car to keep going. God looks past your mouth. See, it's just like when you, when you and your girlfriend or you and your boyfriend have a fight, or you and your spouse, right? You say, that's it, I ain't talking to you no more. Now, you know you, you know you're not, that don't, you know, you know. In fact, even when you walk out the room, you're looking over. That's what Elijah's doing, and that's what you're doing. When, when you tell God how frustrated, how you really feel, the good news is that God will pause to listen. He's not going to condemn you. He's not going to just pat you on the back and say, well, we're all human. I know how you feel, which is not helpful either. But he listens to the whole story. He wants the honest, R, X-rated version of whatever it is you're going through. And, and when he listens, he, he, he's, he's persistent about it. He not only pauses to listen, but then he shows up. He gives Elijah his presence. He, he, he comes into the place with Elijah. He says, Elijah, I want you to stand over there in the cave, and, and I'm going to pass and let you see me. And you know the story, don't you? Not, not in the earthquake, not in the wind, not in the fire. And you know why? Because Elijah had already seen God in that stuff. See, that's what y'all were doing up here, earthquake, wind, and fire. Everybody say, ho, ho. Say, Jesus, Jesus. Say, see that? Y'all, you're used to that. But what, what about when you don't feel like jumping up and down? What about we don't feel like waving your hands in the air? 
Is he still there? Does it have to be noisy for God to show up? Yeah, folks, we don't understand the difference between praise and worship. That's why we fight. That's why, that's why y'all think I ain't saved because I'm Episcopal. Because I go to a worship church. Now, we need more praise. See, worship is quiet. Worship is experiencing the awe. Worship is experiencing the majesty. You, you, you don't stand up like this in worship. You bow down in worship. And, and the problem is most youth ministry people are praise people. We love to praise. We love to make noise. We love to get fired up. And there's a time for that. It ought to be praise and worship. I'm trying to get the Episcopalians to do some more praise. I'll make a deal with you. I'll work with my Episcopal friends on the praise stuff if you work with your youth ministry friends on the worship stuff. See, Elijah had, had all of the flashy stuff. He had all the showy stuff. And now it's time for the quiet. Maybe the reason I like praise better than worship is that when it gets quiet, I actually see not only God for who he is, but I see myself for who I am. Maybe I like praise because it drowns out the sound of my own pain. Maybe I like praise because it drowns out the sound of my own misery. Maybe I like praise because it keeps my mind from thinking about how lonely I am because I ain't got no friends except these kids I'm working with, and they ain't really my friends, and I'm abusing them by trying to make them into my friends because I ain't got no adult friends, and I'm afraid to grow up. So I'll just praise and make a whole lot of noise so I got to think about that. Maybe I like praise because the louder it gets, the less I have to think. But Elijah is put into a place where the word of God comes to him in a still, small voice. And so he gets the presence of God in a different way. And then God speaks to him again and the fourth thing he does he gives him a promise this is the thing i've never seen before i hadn't seen this before this wasn't in the, this ain't in the tape from two years ago he tells elijah to go anoint elisha to be a prophet with him and to go anoint hazael and go anoint jehu and he tells about the work that's going to be going on through them this is a spoken promise from god that god is letting elijah know that the work will continue it's a spoken promise. You, you, you need a word. You, you need to hear God's voice, whether it's audible or inaudible. One of the reasons it's hard to keep going is, is, is a lot of us have not heard from God lately. I'm, I'm not talking about having had your devotions. I'm not talking about having read your Bible. I'm talking about actually clearly understand that in the word that I've read or in the word that's been preached, God has spoken directly to my heart. I was listening to James Montgomery Boyce preach on the radio uh, uh, a couple years ago, and he made a statement I, that, that just fascinated me. He, he, was, he was talking about that scripture that says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, it says in the King James Version. The, the Greek there actually says, by the preaching of Christ. And, of course, every time I'd seen that phrase, the preaching of Christ, I thought that meant faith came when, when, when people preached about Christ. But Dr. Boyce says, no, this is not... The, that kind of a preposition. The preposition of there is the possessive preposition, which means that it's not preaching about Christ, but it is Christ's preaching, Christ doing the speaking. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by Christ's preaching, so that when the human person is standing up there using his human voice, my faith comes because I hear the voice of God coming through the human voice. Have you heard from God lately? Not have you heard a good message, have you heard a good sermon, not, oh boy, 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 pastor was really telling it today. What he said, I don't know, but he sure did tell it. Not that was my favorite sermon, but, but did you hear the voice of Christ speak to your heart? When I was in college, my girlfriend and I lived 800 miles apart. 
and she used to send me letters. I couldn't wait for the letter to come. I used to go down to the mailbox. We had these little windows in the mail room. And if your, your window was dark, it meant you had some mail in there because the mail was in the way of the light. So I'd go down there every morning to see if my window was dark. One day I got down there, my window was real dark. I got the letter out. It was thick. She had put about three stamps on it. Had 20 pages, front and back. Perfume. I went back to my room, I read it, dark. <laughs> then like a typical male, when my roommate came in, I said, hey man, read this. <laughs> <laughs> Forgive me, Lord. <laughs> and as he was reading the letter, you know, he just looked at me and said, yeah, so what? I said, man, look what she's saying in there, look at look. He said, don't mean nothing to me. And I said, how can that not mean anything? All of a sudden, it dawned on me. It, it wasn't for him, and he didn't know her. See, when I read that letter, I, 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 could, I could see Patty's face. When I read that letter, I could hear Patty's voice. When I read that letter, it was like Patty was in the room because I had a relationship with Patty. So I wasn't just reading a letter. I was hearing from Patty. When was the last time when you picked up this book, you weren't just getting your, your stuff for the day. But you read this book and, and you could see his face. You read this book and, and you could hear his voice. You, you read this book and he was all up in the room. You read this book and you knew it was written from his heart to your heart. That's the promise Elijah gets. I'm, I'm still on the throne. There's more work to do. Go back the way you came. And when you get back, here's the other thing you're going to find. This is the other thing I'm going to do for you, Elijah. I'm listening to you. I'm going to help you take care of yourself. I'm going to show up for you. I'm going to make promises for you. He said, I'm going to give you some people. I'm going to give you one to be real tight with. I'm going to give you this brother named Elisha. One of the things, the principle, basic principle in youth ministry for me is that I don't, I don't want anybody in youth ministry who doesn't have an Elisha. If you don't have an adult best friend, you need to quit. Go home, turn in your resignation. In fact, go back to your room tonight, call home, tell them you quit. <coughs> because if you don't have an adult who is your best friend, if you don't have an Elisha who is close to you, then what you're going to do is you're going to turn those kids into your friends. And it's going to be a double disservice. Number one, it's a disservice to them. They don't need any more friends. They got plenty of friends. I got, I got two teenage sons. They don't need a big 45-year-old teenager. They need a father. I, I know friendship evangelism, be a friend to a kid, but, but you got to be an adult friend. You, 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 you can't be 16 again. In fact, maybe the reason some of you are doing youth ministry is you really want to stay 16. There's a whole lot of folk doing youth ministry because they don't want to be around adults, and so this is their comfort zone. Go home and quit. It's all right. If you don't have an adult friend, you don't belong working with kids. The second disservice is that you will be a disservice to the kids because you will start turning them into friends and giving them more than they can handle. They can't handle all your baggage. You're grown. They go up and down like a roller coaster, and you're going to go up and down with them. You need an Elisha. You need a friend. You need an adult friend. You, 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 you need somebody you can talk to and tell them what's going on in your life. But not only does he give them Elisha, he also says, I've got 7,000. And if I had any doubt that this is what the Lord wanted to say tonight, it was completely erased when Bart Campolo said tonight, it's good to be here with 1,200 folk. It means that there's a whole lot of folk who are going through the same thing you're going through, who are fighting the same fight you're fighting, and you need to be surrounded by them on a regular basis. I, I don't understand youth ministry people who stop going to church 
because the church is dry or this church doesn't love kids and they become enemies of the church. They run around talking about how bad the church is and, and what they're really doing is they're trying to build themselves up by making the church look bad. What they're saying is the church is no good, but my ministry's cool. My church doesn't know how to reach kids, but I do. I'm, I'm the truth over here. That's falsehood over there. You need to go to church. And you need to go to church with grown folk. You need to go to church with adults. You need to go to church with adults who think it's you weird when you be jumping up and down in the front. You need to go to church with all those folks because they're all in the 7,000. My grandmother is not going to jump up and down with you like that. Now, she'll jump up and down like this. But she ain't going to be doing this. You need to hang out with the 7,000 because you know that 7,000, they, 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 they know some things that maybe you and I don't know. They've been through some stuff that you and I haven't been through. We, we, somehow we think that 55-year-old church folk were born at the age of 49. Hang out with the 7,000. You'll draw strength from the 7,000. Listen to them give their testimonies. They are guarantors of what it looks like when you get there. Because guess what, Bubba? If you keep on living, you're going to be 55 one day. you got two choices. You either turn 55 or you die sooner. Hang out with the 7,000. Listen to the wisdom of the elders. God has provided them for all of us to glean from and to strengthen us so that when we feel lonely, when we feel like we're by ourselves, we remember that there's still 7,000 who have not bowed their knees to Baal. Right, right. Almost done. I first heard this sermon, this scripture preached 13 years ago at a preacher's conference. And the man who preached it, he preached it the wrong way. He preached it as a sermon of what Elijah did to get rid of his depression. And when it was over, we who were there at the preacher's conference had the opportunity to enter into dialogue and to talk with him and to tell, you know, what we thought was right, what we thought was wrong. And this one man named Marvin Chandler turned to the preacher and he said, you know, I really appreciate your being willing to be, have your sermon critiqued because most of us wouldn't, want, wouldn't like that. And I really have to tell you that because I really want to disagree profoundly with the basic point that you're making. I don't think this is about Elijah taking care of himself. I think this is about God taking care of Elijah. And then Marvin told his own story of his own depression, his three-year bout with clinical depression, a time during which he had resigned the ministry, a time during which he did not preach, a time during which he did not pray, a time during which he did not read scripture. And people would come over on a regular basis to try to talk him out of it, to try and pray with him, to try and sing with him. And he kept pushing him off and pushing him off and pushing him off. Until finally one day he woke up and the depression had lifted. That fog that had been clouding his mental sky had been taken away. Instead of waking up that morning and saying, good God, it's morning, he said, good morning, God. And he put his feet in the road and went down to church and he gave his testimony, not about how he had overcome depression, but how the Lord had brought him through. And when it was over, you know, we, we come from a tradition where folks shake your hand after church and, and after Marvin had given his testimony, his, his shown of R-rated testimony, this one well-meaning saint said, oh, Reverend Chandler, I just think it's so wonderful how in the midst of your depression you held to God's unchanging hand. Marvin said, lady, you didn't hear a word I said. For three years, I didn't pray. For three years, I didn't read scripture. For three years, I didn't go to church. For three years, I, I didn't sing any hymns. Uh, lady, I didn't hold to God's hand. God held to my hand. And that's the truth of scripture. That's the truth of ministry. It's, it's not that you've held on to God. It's not that you've clung close to him. It's not that you're walking with Jesus. It's that Jesus is walking with you. It's not that you're putting yourself in a place to be used. It's that he's putting you in a place where he can use you. It's not that you're getting yourself together for him. It's that he's getting himself all up in you to do what he wants to do. 
So when you feel like giving up, he'll, he'll show up. When you feel like you can't take it anymore, he'll show up. When you're standing by the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army's behind you and the Red Sea's in front of you, he'll show up and build a roadway. When you're in the midst of the lion's den and the lion's about to consume you, he'll show up and shut the lion's jaw. When you're in the fiery furnace and it's so hot that anybody ought to be killed just by virtue of standing in the doorway, he'll walk around and turn into an air conditioner. When you're sick, he'll show up and there'll be a drugstore in his garment. When you're in hell, he'll reach down and raise you from the grave and you'll find yourself saying, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. It ain't about you, it's about him. Jesus didn't even get up from the grave on his own. Think about this on Easter. The Bible says God raised Jesus from the dead. He didn't bust out like Superman or Mighty Mouse. Sing this hymn in my grandmother's church up from the grave. He arose. Da, 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 da. Sound like a superhero. You may like that song. He didn't get up. God raised him. Let him raise you. Lord, tonight. We need to be raised. Try it on our own strength. Try it in our own power. We went out to win the world for you. To win the neighborhood for you. Went out to save souls for you. Didn't work. Forgive us. Raise us in Jesus' name.